Right. When we first talked about having a meeting on early mathematics, there was quite a lot of enthusiasm, but it was also rather clear that no two people agreed on what early math mathematics might mean. Um, and um, it turned out rather nicely that the meeting coincided with an opportunity to present the first Norman Prize to Reveal Nets um, for his um, very nice book with William Noel on the Archimedes Codex. Um, so that provided one focus for this meeting. But my personal perspective is that um, early mathematics has something of the same spirit as early music, which is a phrase which um, has been come to cover in the end really almost anything that the performers feel might count as early music. Um, the latest piece I've heard performed in an early music concert was written um, one week before the performance. Um, but actually I'm going to be talking about much earlier mathematics than last week's, I think. Um, approaching the history of mathematics um, is difficult because the evidence is often incomplete, because we're looking often at work from cultures different from ours, even when we might think these cultures are not that far removed from us in space or time, there are differences. And ultimately, because we cannot approach the subject in ignorance of developments um, that have occurred since the period in question, in the same way as you cannot listen to the music of, say, the 17th century today without an awareness of more modern music um, and therefore, everything sounds very different. And all of these problems are even more acute when we come to look at mathematics from the periods I'm going to talk about this morning, which come actually long before Robin's timeline started on his first slide. So the main subject of this talk um, are some remarkable Neolithic stone balls. Um, these particular ones come from the British Museum. Um, these balls are found um, typically in the northeast of Scotland and not really anywhere outside Scotland. And they date from um, between 3200 and 2500 BCE. So they are about 5000 years old. They're all about three inches in diameter, um, and they're remarkably uniform in that respect. And they're carved with patterns and knobs in shapes which um, show very interesting symmetries. And um, here is another one, this one from Torrey in Aberdeenshire, and this drawing perhaps makes the decoration easier to see. And you will see it has um, tetrahedral symmetry. Um, here are a couple more, from, one from Aberdeenshire, one from Ayrshire, which have the symmetries of the cube, and they basically have six knobs. <laughs> and here is a set from the Ashmolean Museum. What's particularly exciting to mathematicians about these balls is the symmetry of the decoration. Um, the majority have the symmetries of the cube. They have basically six sides. Um, but some have tetrahedral symmetry, and exam um, quite a few, and occasional examples of octahedral, dodecahedral, or icosahedral symmetry have also been found. So we have what um, essentially covered the five platonic solids. Um, just a reminder that the, there are exactly five regular convex polyhedra. Um, the tetrahedron with four faces, cube with six, octahedron with eight, dodecahedron with twelve, and icosahedron with twenty faces. Um, There's lots of stories about their discovery. Sometimes they're attributed to Pythagoras. Um, 
more plausibly, possibly, they're attributed to Theaetetus from the time of Theto, who supposedly not only um, identified them all, but also showed that no others can exist. And they are described in Plato's Timaeus. Um, so they are um, often called the Platonic solids. And Plato, in fact, identifies them um, with the four elements of the Greeks, earth, air, fire, water, and with, in some other sense, the whole of space. So um, they were certainly known and catalogued by Plato. So here uh, is a rather famous photograph of Neolithic balls matching each of the five platonic solids. Um, and you can see that they've been identified with tape, um, in some cases clarifying the symmetry. So we have the um, cube, tetrahedron, um, dodecahedron, icosahedron, and octahedron. And all of these seem to be there in these uh, mysterious objects. So, um, what can one say about these things? I mean, you might conclude that the ancient people who made these objects were aware of the five regular platonic solids. We found symmetries of all five, so that seems reasonable. So, um, the designer of these things, who I'm calling Matt Plato for the sake of having a name, um, obviously knew about the five platonic solids um, 2,000 years before Plato. Furthermore, no regular convex balls in any other platonic solid have ever been found, so presumably Plato knew that there weren't any others that could be made. So um, he, he, was, he or she had classified them very successfully. What else can we say? Well, obviously, there was a lot of interest in symmetry. The modern mathematician studies symmetry through the theory of groups. So you might ask, how far did, Mac did MacPlato get with abstract algebra? The Rakimian classification, basically they've classified the platonic solids. Um, sadly, there's no evidence that they actually got as far as classifying the sporadic finite simple groups, which didn't happen until the last century. Um, and what I hope this is showing is that I'm taking this to slightly ridiculous lengths because um, it seems extremely unlikely that Neolithic man would have thought of these objects in terms of group theory. Um, and we have no idea how they thought of the symmetry of these objects. Um, we don't have any idea how they could have thought about the um, platonic solids, if they knew about them. Um, presenting these examples is possibly slightly misleading because not all the balls have regular convex polyhedral shapes. Um, some have five, seven, or nine knobs, which are not platonic solids. Um, some have many more. The biggest one, I think, has 160 knobs. And I, I should have said over 400 of these things are known. Um, and the biggest category, certainly, is ones with the symmetries of the cube. But um, there are lots of other kinds as well. What was the inspiration? Um, again, John has brought along a nice little clay model, which I won't pass around, but it's on the slide. Um, one suggestion from, from John Robinson, the sculptor, is that uh, if you're working in clay, it makes natural sense to stick things together so that the knobs could have been thought of as additions um, working in clay. Um, and that could have carried over to the sculpture. But really, we have no idea how, um, you know, why they would have been made. What were they for? Were they mathematical models for Neolithic, Neolithic, sorry, for Neolithic classrooms teaching platonic geometry? Um, probably not, but there, there have been serious suggestions made, I think. Um, these objects aren't found in graves which rather suggests they were not prized personal possessions, despite their intricacy and the effort that's gone into making them. Were they weapons when you could tie a leather thong round the knobs and turn it into a bolus? Um, were they used as weights or measures? I mean, they are quite uniform in size, but not in weight. 
when he used them board games. It's not entirely a ridiculous idea. There are, are quite early games, though not necessarily 5,000 years old, involving throwing objects from A to B and so on. Um, could they have been used as rollers to transport megaliths um, in building standing stones? Some of them have been found near megalith sites, so it's possible they could have acted as ball bearings. Um, where are they sink stones for fishing nets? Again, one can see that they might have worked in that way. Um, where are they perhaps passed around at meetings indicating the person who had the right to speak? So that you could only speak when you had the stone. That's quite a useful function. I wish people had these at the meetings I attend. Um, where are they oracles or dice? And there are, I mean, obviously, regular shapes function as dice, and there are polyhedral dice from other cultures. Here are two currently on display in the Barber Institute in Birmingham um, from um, late Hellenic or, uh, or Roman um, times in Egypt, and these appear to me to be two icosahedral um, dice. They're, they're certainly dice and they put <coughs> letters representing numbers marked on them. If you have very good eyesight, you'll see that according to the catalogue and according to the exhibition, um, one of these is an icosahedron and the other is a dodecahedron with 12 sides. Um, I count 20 sides in both of them, so clearly the ancient Egyptians weren't very good at arithmetic. So, um, what were they for? I have a personal note to add here. Um, the, some years ago, on the History of Mathematics mailing list, Historia Mathematica, which sadly no longer exists, um, these objects were mentioned, and I knew that the Royal Museum of Scotland sold a postcard showing one of these objects. This is it. I think it's the same one we saw earlier. And I offered to get copies of his postcard for any of this member who was interested. So I went to the National Museum of Scotland, the postcard shop, to buy some copies of this postcard and found next to it another postcard, which is this one, which shows 19th century carpet bowls. And there's a remarkable similarity with the patterns. Um, this one here has the symmetries of the cube um, in the pattern, and I think there's another one, um, is it this one, that's the same pattern. So, you know, these objects from a very different time have this very similar, it seems to me, designs. So, uh, my suggestion is that these objects we've been looking at were Neolithic carpet poles. Um, I'm not aware that anybody previously has discussed whether Neolithic man had carpets, so there's whole new areas of research being opened up here, I think. Um, and these objects continue to inspire. Here is a sculpture by Peter Randall Page. I put this one in because I found the postcard next to the other two last night. Um, but Peter Randall Page does work which um, is um, inspired often by these kind of objects. And if you go to Edinburgh now, um, I discovered these while um, on a visit to the Usher Hall. Um, at the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, Opposite the Usher Hall, there's an installation called First Conundrum by Remco de Fou, which involves um, modern sculptures based on these um, objects, both in the sculpture itself and spilling out into the surrounding square. And members of the public are invited to interact with them, as they aren't very comfortable to sit on, however. And it, um, so, um, echoes of these mysterious objects are found in contemporary art um, as well. And I want to mention another interesting and rather older mathematical connection. Um, sorry. Um, going back a lot further into history, um, we have hand axes. Um, these are used um, are found in large numbers in Europe, Africa, and Northern Asia, and even found in very large numbers. They're objects with sharp edges, made by napping, 
and they fit comfortably into your hand. And again, there is a certain amount of uncertainty as to their purpose. It seems likely that they were used for butchery, um, and modern studies have shown that they're quite effective um, for that, and particularly in providing access to bone marrow. Uh, there are other hypotheses. There's the killer frisbee hypothesis, which is a serious hypothesis, but I don't think modern trials have been done on that one. Um, but one issue is that of the very many hand axes found, surprisingly few show any signs of wear. And you would think that tools used for cutting would show signs of wear. Um, so another theory is that these were um, display objects, um, basically sorry, objects made to um, impress women um, and that this would explain why we have so many and why they are not used because if you are trying to demonstrate the ability to make a very nice, effective, symmetric hand axe um, you can't just turn up with one because you might have stolen somebody else's you have to be seen to make it so they will be made sort of on the spot, possibly and that theory is put forward in Marek Cohen's book um, as we know it. Um, but there's one other interesting property which I'm now going to demonstrate. Um, what I have here is an object I found a couple of days ago when I was excavating in my bottom drawer of my desk. And it's probably not Neolithic uh, or, or Paleolithic. It's um, made of translucent plastic, although you probably can't see that in the OHP. But it's something called a rattleback. And if I spin it, okay. If I spin it, it spins very nicely, particularly on this surface. If I spin it in the other direction, it doesn't like it. And it goes back and apparently contradicts the law of conservation of angular momentum. Which way do I do it? That's wrong way. Um, and it's an object which sort of appeals to mathematicians and um, how do I fix And it turns out that these um, hand axes, um, or celts as they're sometimes called, are in fact rattlebacks. They have this property that, um, here's a little poem, behold the mysterious celt with a property that amuses, one may it will spin, the other way it diffuses. These hand axes appear to do this. And one imagines that archaeologists discovered this by accident. Um, it, um, so was this something that was behind the making of them? And um, the mathematics of rattlebacks has only relatively recently been understood. Um, Sir Herman Bondy was, um, published a paper in the 1980s um, explaining um, the mathematics and uh, they're still, I mean, the mathematics is quite difficult, and I certainly don't understand it, but it doesn't appear now to be understood, but that is very recent. So was this property of interest to Stone Age hand axe makers? Were they aware of it? Um, were these things puzzles and toys, in the same way that we have mathematical puzzles today? Um, in fact, being a Rattleback is not such an unusual property. Um, here's a little video from Hugh Hunt showing that a modern telephone receiver actually works as a hand axe. <laughs> so, and that probably wasn't why it was designed that way. So it may be a bit unrealistic to see, to make too much of this property, but nevertheless it's provocative. So, um, I've looked at two classes of very old objects, um, in both of which there are some mathematical echoes for us. Um, we'll be hearing this afternoon from Joe Marchant about how modern science has helped us understand the very mysterious Antikythera mechanism. Um, it'd be very nice to think that someday we will have similar insights into these macrophonic solids um, but it's very hard actually to imagine 
how, what further evidence there might ever be. So until that unlikely event of having some new breakthroughs, and these objects are going to remain mysterious. We might like to imagine some mathematical kinship with our ancient ancestors. Um, we might like to think that they took a similar sort of enjoyment of the symmetry properties or the rattleback property to the enjoyment we take today. But it's pretty fanciful. Um, nevertheless, we can still enjoy the music of um, Bach and Mozart even when we are familiar with Beethoven and Schoenberg. And I think we have to approach these objects in a similar spirit. We can't understand the culture and the feelings behind the makers, but we can imagine some human kinship and mathematical connection with them. So, thank you very much. <laughs>